is going to be a, a wild program. We're going to go into areas tonight that we don't go into nearly often enough, and we talk about it. In fact, when I look at the Internet as the beast that it is, one of the most common terms I see coming up in alternative media posts and essays and stories is MK Ultra. He's MK Ultra. She's MK Ultra. It's an MK Ultra program. Well, okay, at least people are thinking on the right side of the picket fence. The truth of the matter is, MK Ultra is ancient. It's ancient history. MK Ultra was actually the code name of a U.S. government human research operation experimenting in the behavioral engineering of, of us. And it was conducted through guess who's? Well, it was the CIA's Scientific Intelligence Division. That CIA project, as some of you may know, was coordinated with the Special Ops Division of the Army's Chemical Corps. Interesting collusion there. The program, now get this, this is what I'm talking about. When people start throwing MK Ultra around, they don't know really what they're talking about. The program began in the early 1950s. All right? It's not current. It was sanctioned in 53 officially, then reduced in its scope in the 60s, and finally halted, allegedly, officially, in 1973. Well, I assume that they may well have halted the formal MK Ultra project, but they certainly didn't ultra mind control. They simply took it to the next level. Now, that was 40, 41 years ago. Do you think they might have made progress in 41 years on mind control, how to influence people in ways that they would otherwise never dream of, of acting out, such as mass murder, serial killers, you name it. Uh, the human mind is an electrical device. It's not chemical, it's electrical. We're electrical first. And if you can figure out a way to address, invade, program, that electrical machine, which is what computing is all about, you can pretty much take anyone over and make them do whatever you want. And in many cases, most cases, they don't know anything about it. They haven't a clue that they're being used. So when you, when you use the term MK Ultra, understand you're really talking about horse and buggy terminology and technology, as it was. Our guest tonight, I've wanted to have this young man on for quite a long time. He is, in my view, a prodigy. He is packed full of information. He has a passion to learn, and he has learned a great deal. He is a mind control expert. His name is Neil Sanders. And this is going to be fun because his book is out now, and I'll, there's a little review of it. You can see on his homepage. Click on his name. In the first volume of his book, which is as one of the all-time great titles, Your Thoughts Are Not Your Own, Amen to That, Neil Sanders exposes the evidence for officially sanctioned mind control programs. And I might get into the non-officially sanctioned mind control programs, of which I suspect there are many out there, such as TV. Sanders has degrees in psychology, film, and media studies, and is a qualified hypnotherapist as well. He spent many years collecting and analyzing declassified documents, scientific papers, court transcripts, confessions from doctors, and testimony from victims and whistleblowers as well, and much more. Do visit his website. It is extraordinary, and he's up very early in the morning or in the middle of the night. Somewhere it's dark there anyway in the UK. Are you there, Neil, and can you hear me all right? I am. Uh, hi, Jeff. How are you doing? You all right? I'm okay. Thank you. Doing well. And glad to have you along. Thank you for... What time is it over there? It's about quarter past three, so it's about about five hours until I phone in work and lie and tell them that I'm ill. <laughs> all right. If they want to back up, they'll, they can call me. I'll tell them. <laughs> that's, that's fine. He was, you give me a note, will you? I will, I will. He was sick. He couldn't. He that's did, very kind of you. Yeah, it's no problem at all. So, Neil Sanders, what got you into this whole field of the dark arts? Why, why mind control? What is it about that, that intrigues you? And when did you start? 
Well, um, I mean, I got interested in, in mind control. It was a strange, strange experience, really. Basically, a friend of mine, uh, his older brother's friend, uh, pressed me to watch this film, The Manchurian Candidate. And I said, oh, I'll go watch The Manchurian Candidate. It's got these... I was like, who's in it? It's uh, Frank Sinatra. I was like, uh -huh. oh, brilliant. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah. watch that. My, my response, exactly. <laughs> yeah, quite. But and it, and it was in black and white as well, so that didn't really interest me terribly. But but I I did watch it, and uh, because you know this guy, I very much respected him. And um, not only did I find the film fascinating, but basically I then started to to look at the sort of things that could be done. You know, obviously, you first elements that you start to look at are things like stage hypnotism and hypnosis in general, and that sort of thing, just to see if it works. And I also was was interested in psychology, so I was kind of getting a, a sort of picture about the separation of the mind and how, how the mind is in, in all schools of psychological thought. It, it, it has sections. There are defense mechanisms like amnesic barriers and, and the like. Um, there are uh, short circuits. There are ways that you can get people to respond um, favorably or unfavorably to, to a situation just by the, the use of certain words or body language, uh, for example. Like, uh, an example is um, take your sunglasses off if you're speaking to somebody because the eye contact me means that you connect on a more interpersonal level. Mm -hmm. Just very basic stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then, obviously, from there, I got interested in, in Sirhan Sirhan and um, the stories about Sirhan Sirhan and obviously the, 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 the fact that he appeared to be uh, under hypnotic control and firing uh, blanks out of his gun that only uh, held eight bullets, but miraculously managed to spray 14 bullets, some of them from behind the, um, uh, the senator's head, which, so, you know, it's a remarkable... He's a quite, uh, quite a trick-shot artist, that guy, yeah. Oh, yes, he's, he's obviously very, very skilled. And then, you know, you look into that and you, you see that, that what he was talking about, saying that he believed that he was at a shooting range. And I started to look at that and go, okay, that's, that's plausible. That, that's actually plausible from a sort of scientific standpoint as, mm -hmm. as well. Not that mm -hmm. I'm any great scientist, but, you know, it... It, it sort of twigged with me. And then from there, basically, the, what really sort of piqued my interest was the sort of tangential weirdness that was connected to the Manchurian Candidate film. I mean, obviously, it, it was released um, shortly uh, before the, the assassinations of the Kennedys, and then Frank Sinatra, who was friends with the Kennedys, uh, had, it, had it banned uh, until the, the mid-'80s. And then you start to look at the, the other weird things about it, like, for example... John Frankenheimer, who's the director, was having dinner with Roman Polanski um, and Robert Kennedy the night, the night before he was assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan, who a lot of people believe to be a Manchurian candidate. That's pretty so, weird, um, Neil. I yeah, didn't, I didn't know that. that that's, uh, that's beyond the probabilities of coincidence. It something. gets a bit strange as well because, the, I mean, the, you know, some of these could be coincidences, and they obviously are, but... For example, Jay Sebring was the person that sort of stapled the toupee to Frank Sinatra's head, and he was also the person that supplied the drugs for the Camelot crowd, the, uh, you know, the Kennedys, the Peter Law. It was Jay uh, Sebring that yes, did absolutely. that? Jay I, I know yeah, exactly Jay where you're going with this. This is going to blow our listeners' minds. Uh, yeah. Well, Jay Sebring was one of the victims of the so-called Manson killings. He was killed by Tex, uh, Tex Watson, um, uh, August the 8th, 1969. Um, yeah, he was yeah, a very was famous a hair, hair designer, hairdresser. Yeah, he would have been Vidal Sassoon if it hadn't have been for the fact that he, you know, died. He was actually, uh, through yeah. Sebring International, he was marketing a range of uh, hair products for men. Yep. You know, this is, again, that comes into a sort of concept of mind control, because up until that point, it was considered a bit namby-pamby for, for men to be concerned with their, their appearance in any great way. And then he got very, very sort of macho people, or considered macho people like time. Steve McQueen and Frank Sinatra to, to publicly advocate him. Um, yeah, and then obviously he became one of the victims of the Manson uh, murders, or the so-called Manson murders. Mm -hmm. Bizarrely, Dee Dee Lansbury was living at the Chatsworth Ranch, um, you know, the Spahn Ranch for, for a short time, and uh, traveling around with the Manson family. In her pocket, she had a signed note from Angela Lansbury giving her permission to be away from her parents. What? Yes. Yeah, this, yeah. this is Angela Lansbury. Yeah. Unbelievable. A permission slip for murder, she wrote, apparently. This is, uh, this is remarkable. Well, well this, this is the this, point, you know. Yeah, this, this, let me just say one thing. What, what Neil has just laid out here 
is the substance already that a, a major book could be written about. We're talking about connections that are just really bizarre. J. Sebring is a name that most of you probably forgot. I, I remember the name because it was one of those names. It's a great name. Sebring International, J. Sebring. I mean, he obviously was going to be a mega star, a mega celebrity. And that was, that was ended. Angela Lansbury. Now, tell us a little bit more about Angela Lansbury and, and that, that connection. I'm very interested in that for a number of reasons. Well, I mean, basically, that, that was it, really. Her daughter wanted to go and, and hang out with this bunch of hippies that she met at the uh, Chatsworth, uh, the Spahn uh -huh. Ranch, yeah. which was an ex-movie ranch, sure. where people like Ronald Reagan, here's an interesting one as well, the gun that was used to kill Jay Sebring was, it was stolen, well, it was given to a, a, a guy called Randy Starr, who was a stuntman on a film, and it was given to him by a young cowboy, a, a young actor playing a cowboy, who went by the name of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so, so the gun that was used to kill Jay Sebring was actually once in the possession of Ronald Reagan. How bizarre. How Quite. truly bizarre. All right, the, 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 yeah. The, the, I mean, the, the Angela Lansbury thing was just simply that. But, I mean, the other person that was, that was famous that occasionally hung out with the, the Manson family was Dina Martin, which was Dean Martin's daughter. She was actually the person that introduced Nancy Pittman to the group. Nancy Pittman was also known as Brenda McCann. And she was considered one of the sort of more hardcore, um, uh -huh. you know, the whole Manson thing's a bit of a misnomer anyway, So, but she was considered one of the sort of hardcore members of the clan. So, you know, these, these sort of brushes with celebrity mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. the, the strange thing was that the, the other strange connection to um, MK Ultra was that Roman Polanski, who was obviously the husband of Sharon Tate, who was killed in the Tate murders, mm -hmm. obviously, he was in London at the time trying to get together a film called Day of the Dolphins. Now, Day of the Dolphins was based on the experiments of uh, Dr. John Lilly, who was con connected to MK Ultras for Project 62. Mm -hmm. And specifically what John Lilly was doing, I mean, John Lilly did a lot of things. He, he actually mapped the pleasure and pain centers of the brain. He was the, one of the first people to do this uh, and therefore prove that by electrical stimulation, you could manipulate people to do things by either making them feel intense pleasure or intense pain. And, and he sort of expanded this onto um, uh, dolphins, cats, dogs, and that sort of thing, injecting LSD into the brains, and, but also basically trying to, to get them to be a sort of remote control device. You know those, um, we actually still have them, we have dolphins that have got like nuclear warheads attached to them, and occasionally yeah. they sort of go, go astray, and so they're mm -hmm. sort of floating around like some sort of terrifying but awful Bond villain. And... Um, and basically, they were doing that, and this was one of the things that they were doing in MK Ultra. Roman Polanski was actually trying to get a film about that scenario going, and he was in London at the time that his wife was killed, trying to get this film, Day of the Dolphin, going. But in, in his film, the dolphins could actually talk, and they were going to be the heroes of the piece. Uh, but unfortunately, That's, you know, mm. that vision will never see the light of day. No, no, then, that... Th this, uh, you mentioned another name that's uh, suitable for a program. I'd love to do more on... Dr. John Lilly, what a strange, oh, yes. what a strange dude he was. Uh, Absolutely. He, uh, he, he, we, I've talked on this program about the so-called Lilly wave before. Now, the Lilly wave is a certain electromagnetic frequency, and uh, I don't know if you know. Let me tell this little quick story, and you'll, you may find it of interest. Sure. Uh, Pat, Dr. Pat Flanagan went over to visit a friend of his uh, in his laboratory, which was actually his garage in his home. He lived in a suburban neighborhood. And down every block, of course, were electrical wires and telephone poles and so forth and transformers and all that. Well, Pat Flanagan went into the garage, and the, the guy he knew was in there working on a bench. And there was a, an oscilloscope there. And on the oscilloscope was, was a waveform, which is well known. It's the lily wave. People in that line of work know the lily wave by sight pretty well. Mm. And he went up to his friend. He said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just doing this and that. And he said, what are you doing with the lily wave on there? And his friend looked up at Pat Flanagan and said, you're not going to believe this. He said, guess where it's coming from? And Pat said, I, I don't know. He said, it's coming from there. And he pointed to the wall plug. It was coming from the electric grid. And it didn't get there on its own. Control in America. Dot com. Stephen Jacobson. 
all media is propaganda. All of it. It's a great quote. Well, it, it's it's true, and the mind control issue has been with us for a very, very, very long time. It's an ancient problem because mankind has been subjected to manipulation and control. We were born into a system of lies and deception right from the get-go, and so were our parents born into the same kind of situation that many people accept as being the way things are simply as the result of habit and consider it natural and normal and it's anything but that. The basic, very simple control of information throughout our lives, uh, if we don't have all the facts on any given issue, our judgment can only be as good as the quality of our information. And if we've been fed half truths and lies and missing information, then we are at a disadvantage. Two means by which we are con uh, manipulated and controlled. One is the control of information. The consolidation of ownership of the medium facilitates that and allows for the coordination of different media uh, as part of a uh, propaganda campaign. Right now, all media is controlled by a handful of multinational corporations. Back in 1980, a book came out, uh, The Media Monopoly by uh, Ben Bedickian. At that time, it was revealed that 50 major corporations were controlling America's media. And as the book was revised, the new editions came out, that number kept getting smaller and smaller until now we have five major multinational companies that are controlling not only the information we have access to, but the entertainment choices. The trick is to change the state of mind to disarm it, to take its defenses down or otherwise modify them so they're no longer very efficient and the material can go right into the subconscious without any kind of interference, judgment, or processing. Plunk right in. All right, Stephen, the techniques used to put the mind or the consciousness into an altered state, take it from beta down through alpha in, into theta, uh, so it's mesmerized. And when it's in that state, and it's usually the old, the old television flicker, Although with HD, I'm not sure the flicker is still there anymore. What it would do, it would, in a matter of seconds, like the first time takes about a minute, but after that it's just seconds, put the mind into a state where anything it was absorbing would simply go right past all filters and into the subconscious and, and wait there to be called up when the proper stimulation was encountered. Tell us more. Yes, that's absolutely correct. The, the the most successful propaganda uses the arts and entertainment as a delivery system. And, and television is a good example of explaining both the principles of hypnotic programming as well as the techniques. I'd say that television is by far the most powerful weapon of psychological warfare in history. And I consider that so important and yet, many people, if not most, don't think of television in those terms as a weapon. How, how people think of television as simply an elective choice in terms of entertainment and information, when in point of fact, the television is the boss. Yes, and it's illustrating how we are taught what's right and wrong, what's acceptable and unacceptable behavior, to storytelling. Storytelling is the oldest means of transmitting information about how society works. There isn't much difference between primitive man sitting fixated in front of the flickering light of a campfire, telling stories about how things work, transmitting information from one generation to the next. Not much difference between that and modern man sitting fixated in front of the flickering light of a television, receiving information, the same kind of information, how society works what's acceptable and unacceptable behavior, what's right and wrong. The first order of business for a propagandist or an advertiser is to create the circumstances that are going to induce a state of mind that is most favorable to the reception of their message. That state of mind is the hypnotic state of mind.
state of mind, natural. We go in and out of it throughout the day. It's a twilight state of mind in which there is no conscious mental activity going on. The mind is a blank slate, and it is in this state of mind where we are highly suggestible and more vulnerable to manipulation than at any other time. Television induces this state of mind in the viewer naturally and automatically because of the nature of the medium. And we can even catch ourselves when we're in front of a TV going into that state uh, of losing our sense of time and place. We're simply there. We're soaking up information like a sponge. The, the television is literally plugging into our nervous system. It's a literal uh, interfacing of the electronic media with our nervous system. Back in uh, the late 1990s, 700 children had to be hospitalized in response to watching a TV cartoon. This happened in Japan. Japan, yep, I the, remember. The cartoon yeah. was the, the highly popular Pokemon. Pokemon. The press all over the world reported on this incident. Well, what happened was that strobing uh, flashes of light pulsated from the eyes of one of the cartoon characters. And this caused epileptic-like seizures. Hold and, on, Stephen. Hold on, would you please? We have to pause right there. We'll come back. Stephen. Okay, we're talking to you about things that control you, not necessarily through conversation or the auditory vector, but through the eyes. And then the ear is second, but it's the eyes that tend to lead you. Although music is quite compelling in its own cadences as well. It's an, it's an all-fronts assault on you to disarm you and make you amenable to all kinds of input, which they design ever so carefully. Nothing is really left to chance. Stephen, please go ahead. Regarding children and television, prior to the advent of TV, you never heard about attention deficit disorder. Didn't they, exist. Nope. nope. And what's happening here is that the quick cutting pattern that were developed in TV commercials and music videos, they cause a, a corresponding chemical electrical impulse in the brain. And that releases endorphins that have a drug-like effect on the body. So a child can sit motionless, fixated, watching television. And when they're away from the television, they have all this nervous energy, can't focus their attention, can't sit still. And that's because they're looking for the same kind of drug-like effect that they're getting from TV and other kinds of activities, and they're not getting it. Another illustration right. of this plug-in effect that television has with our nervous system, because we've already been changed as a population by the illustration of hypnotic programming, using, for a, another example, the news broadcast that everyone is grown familiar with, both your national news and your local, local news broadcaster. If you think about it, regardless of the background of the newscaster, regardless of their ethnic background, whether they be black, white, oriental, Hispanic, doesn't matter. With few exceptions, they all speak the same way. They have a pattern of speaking that the public has been conditioned to accept as the means by which we receive true factual information. The newscaster looks directly into the camera and into the eyes of the viewer, which is another hypnotic technique. The newscaster is an authority figure, which is uh, another element. People will tend to accept information, even if they don't understand it, if it is coming from an accepted and respected authority, and then the information repeated over and over and over again until it becomes a conditioned response. This not only happened in the days of television, but even before television, mm -hmm. in the radio. The famous broadcast of Orson Welles' uh, dramatization of H.G. Welles' War of the oh, World I, I, caused panic yeah. in this country. No, classic. Yes, uh, people actually thought New Jersey was being invaded by Martians. Well, I would have if I'd have been back there then. I, I well, was done very the, the realistically. The reason for it was that the dramatization was done as a news broadcast. Yeah, and news and, even then was considered hallowed ground in terms of questioning it. I mean, that was the oracle of God news. Yes, and, and, hold and on. it shows that even then 
the population had been programmed and conditioned to accept the format as the as the means by there which we receive true factual information. Exactly and, right. Uh, and yeah. it just wasn't so. Isn't it amazing the amount of sophisticated, absolutely complete control that they're they're working toward now, cradle to grave. Well, yeah. it only shows their one their paranoia. And their fear. Correct. They're afraid they, they, of us. They have fear, too. You see, they keep us entrained and entranced uh, via fear, anxiety, anticipation, and all the rest of those related synonyms. And yet, on the other side of the coin, they themselves are driven by fear that we might become out of control. And wake up. Right. And that's what they're trying to prevent. The And, and that's essentially a, a spiritual condition. The mind control issue is first and foremost a spiritual issue. Its foundation is spiritual. The, the mind is the gateway to the soul. That's why there's mind control issue. And we, in mass, humanity is at the threshold of an awakening that they seek to prevent. Because if people wake up, the wake up means uh, come into an awareness, a spiritual a realization. Because that's the only thing that's going to solve the problems that we face. Uh, they're, they're just very so basic and fundamental. We're not going to fix things with Band-Aid measures, trying to tinker here and there and fix the economy. You're not going to fix the economy without attending to the issue of uh, honest weights and measures and, and, and honest uh, uh, medium of, of exchange as the uh, lifeblood uh, of, uh, of commerce. Uh, the dishonest money system has corrupted all segments of society, including organized religion, which is part of the problem. This is a, a, a the mind control issue is a spiritual issue. And the fundamental problem for mankind is that we have been encouraged to misidentify ourselves as the physical body. And when people do that, then they become fearful because the body is subject to death. And by keeping people afraid and, and stressed out uh, and great anxiety, for long periods of time is a strategy of, of psychological warfare because then people can't think clearly. Uh, Add to this the manipulation of economic factors and you have a twin pencil movement where the population is literally being squeezed. The, the nation mm -hmm. is suffering from the effects of a scientifically induced nervous breakdown. That's what we're seeing all around us. We are the first media generation that caused a, a psychological standardization that later was fragmented and so that uh, different groups can be spoken to uh, individually and programmed individually. The real issue, it's a spiritual issue. And spiritual consciousness is the only solution to the problems and suffering of material existence. And it's on that platform where we have our power because it requires us to look within for the answers, and that's the only way we're going to find them. We've been conditioned to look outside of ourselves for the answers and to use our mind in an analytical way to, to think our way out of a problem. Right. Thinking got us into this mess. It and, sure did. And the quality of our thinking has to change. We haven't been taught how to think. We've been taught what to no. think. And yep. God forbid that we've learned how to think, because that's what these guys are are afraid of. Uh, there are more of us than there are of them, and the only way can, they can control and, and manipulate the large masses is through illusion and deception. And they it's like the, the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Exactly. And the cultivation of, of this anxiety and fear is astoundingly profitable. Look at the psychopharmacological maniacs at work coming up with these fluoride-based drugs, SSRIs, all kinds of psychotropic medications, which literally, if the television and the lifestyle and the peer pressure and the media and the self-absorption and the narcissism of the physical body doesn't do it, these drugs will. And they'll seal the individual uh, permanently into a, a crypt of morose behavior and absolute obedience obedience to a paradigm that is antithetical to human life as it used to be.